Hello everyone and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm Anthony Pastore. Inflation continues to rise, equity markets maintain their volatility, and the Fed lies in wait. All the while, fears of a recession continue to plague investors. So, are there any signs out there of economic normalization, or are we seeing signals of an economic decline? Well, joining me now to discuss this is Jason Dreho, the head of Tactical Asset Allocation Americas for the Chief Investment Office. Jason, always nice to have you here on the show. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Anthony. So, I, clearly, there's a lot to talk about. We are all concerned about re- inflation. Uh, as, you know, as we look at the markets, we see what's happening out there with prices. The war in Ukraine continues. That's also adding to pressures. But recession, the word recession is being thrown around quite a bit. Um, and f- the fears of recession are growing every day. S- most specifically, we just saw the consumer price index come out 8.5%, which was a- widely expected by economists and our own chief investment office here where you are. But that's the highest in f- over 40 years, since late 1981. Why is that the case? What's going on here? So with inflation overall, like, you know, and, the- and why it sort of rose in March versus February, Higher gas prices, right? Like we knew inflation would sort of peak around this time. The in- extra increase from 7.9% in February to 85 in March was because of gas. We know how much oil jumped, like 20% because of the war in, in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. You know, there's other factors that are going on in the economy that's kind of lifted inflation higher. I think what's kind of positive, and why the markets actually reacted initially positively to the inflation print, was that it looks like it's the peak. And so this is where, like, if you look at sort of the details, you break it down in terms of, like, different prices from used cars prices, they're actually now starting to decline. You're seeing, like, rental prices or rental rates for apartments sort of, you know, very high. They're coming down to more sort of reasonable levels. If you look at the price of different durable goods on a month-over-month basis, those are actually only kind of zero. They're flat. Mm -hmm. Year over year, it's still positive. But if you think about the momentum, that momentum is coming down. So I think that's why inflation is high, likely at its peak and likely trending lower from there. Yeah. It, but it's interesting because we're talking about the potential of a recession. And you wrote in a recent blog that uh, this survey of institutional investors found that 60% of them are expecting a, a recession. Um, that's not the case here in CIO. But you look at, and clearly we know the, def, the definition, I should say, what if you've taken a finance class or an economics class, it's two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, which we haven't seen since last year. So it doesn't seem likely that we're going to have a recession in the next year, six to 12 months or so. What, what are your thoughts on that? So I think the, it almost feels like it's becoming consensus among investors that a recession would start you know, this year or at least by the end of 2023. And so at 60% is sort of like a bit of arbitrary, but mm-hmm. definitely there's a lot of sort of bearishness that's really picked up in the past, you know, I'd say even two or three weeks. I think a lot of that stems on concerns about the Fed. The Fed's hiking, getting more aggressive, and that they will end up hiking too much and that will kind of kill the expansion, we'll get a recession. They'll make a policy mistake. So I think that's the number one. High inflation we just talked about, you know, it's impacting consumers. Consumer spending is going to slow. That's going to be bad for the economy. Again, sort of recession risk. There's also reports of like, you know, trucking, you know, activity slowing down. You've seen trucking rates decline. A freight recession is being sort of tossed around. So this is, I think you add this all up. This is why people are pessimistic. When you actually look at the data, and like you can look at sort of, you know, a broad swath of data, it's hard to think based on what you can see for consumers, you know, income growth, balance sheets, productive activity in the economy, that a recession in the next 12 months is likely. You know, most kind of recession prediction models, which are kind of quantitative based on a lot of data, put it less than probably 10% in the next 12 months. But if you go out from 12 to 24 months, then that probability goes up to say like 35%. So that's kind of roughly in line our view, like we're saying maybe like a 25% chance of a recession happening in the next year or so. Because when you look at the overall data, like you know, the consumer, for example, Consumer spending is holding up well. I mean, the data we can see for March suggests it's it's still quite strong. You're seeing a transition away from people buying goods to services. So people aren't buying big screen TVs. They're going on trips, as we kind of you know, were discussing earlier. So I think that's ultimately a good thing. That's you know the point about normalization. We're seeing a lot of normalization in the economy. Normalization is ultimately good. It's also disinflationary. So the coin is, are we kind of normalizing? Or are we kind of trending much lower? It's hard to tell exactly in real time, but I think there's sort of too much discounting of the normalization, too much concern about we just kind of shoot past trend and go to the zero or negative. Yeah, I mean, but also you, you've got in- investor sentiment out there. And look, the, the truth of the matter is you can watch any number of the, the media companies on television and it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They talk about recession and all of a sudden the fears just blow up. It, they All they mentioned was, of course, the yield curve inversion that happened uh, two weeks ago, the twos and the tens inverted, even just for a moment. But, of course, that started the talk of recession fears. Is, is that something that we should take a look at? 
but clearly it seems to be more than just a few items that will contribute to something like that. So, you know, take the yield curve, right? People sort of point to it. There was the, the what people look at is the difference between the 10-year yield and the two-year yield. That briefly, like one day, went to about minus eight basis points. Um, you don't hear as much about the fact that now it's back up to 28 basis That's points. That's right, of course. So there's a little bit of like, you kind of pick your data points, you know, and it's like, you know, when you get something like that, you kind of run with it. Mm -hmm. And we think about also like different parts of the yield curve, if you really want to use it as an information source, other parts of the curve would say, no, actually recession risk is lower or it's not inverted. So even that piece of data, if you believe it, it's not of not consistently telling the same story. And then you look at other data, like, you know, where is debt levels? Where is, you know, kind of productive activity? A lot of these aren't at all consistent with sort of late cycle behavior that typically the yield curve would indicate. So it's a part of a mosaic and you have to take it seriously. But if you just look at that and say, all right, a recession's coming, you miss a lot of other stuff that, you know, would suggest, you know, there's things that aren't nearly as bad as that one data point might imply. Mm -hmm. And as you said, if, if, if we look at consumer spending or the expectations for it, we, we, as you just alluded to, travel is expected to be really high this coming summer travel season in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, compared to the last two years when a lot of people stopped traveling because of the pandemic. Um, the numbers that they're expecting are way higher than what we've seen. So it doesn't really reflect on what people might be in fear of. If you're fearing a recession, you don't spend the money to go take a European vacation with your family. So I give on the sentiment point, I, I was talking to an economist last week who was in Europe, talking to European investors. They're all very, very bearish. What do you, you know, what's going on? Then you ask, well, are you going to reduce your portfolio? So maybe not. Are you going to, you know, if you're managing a company, are you going to lay off workers? No, we, we think things are going to be okay. So there's this almost picture, big picture that things are bad for the economy, but me personally, my situation is okay. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a bit of disconnect between what people are saying versus what they're actually doing. Now, we don't know exactly really what's going on in the economy because there's a lot of noise, there's adjustments. Uh, you know, the, the whole thing about assessing where we are in the economies, we've had essentially two years of extreme distortions caused by the pandemic. I mean, our consumption patterns shifted dramatically in ways that you know, they don't normally shift in any economic cycle. We've had supply disruptions things are kind of getting back to normal. Like people are kind of going out and living their lives more mm -hmm. and more. Some of these supply bottlenecks are easing. So after these extreme distortions, we need to kind of normalize to whatever post-pandemic reality is. But it causes extreme movements one way or another, like prices overshoot, you know, like auto prices. Lumber prices shot last year, now they're actually falling. So you're seeing sort of the market work Prices work, you know, prices go up, it induces more supply, it curtails demand. That's good, but it takes time for this to happen. Sure. So as this is going on, I think it's a positive, but it's also hard to read, are things slowing much more or is it the shifting back to something normal? And, you know, six months from now, we'll have more clarity. Of right course. now, it's hard to say. Where's that crystal ball when you need it, right, exactly. Jason? And look, also, you've got probably a lot of folks out there who are using their credit cards, like both of us are, have a lot of airline miles and vacation points that are just sitting idly by and they're looking to use them for this summer because they've been holding on to them and accumulating for two years with no travel. So let me get back to inflation with you for a second. So if we do indeed see inflation start to taper as we get towards the back half of the year, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty with the war in Ukraine and other factors, but do, do you think that that might change the direction of the Fed this year? As we uh, have anticipated, the Fed will likely raise rates six more times before the end of 2022. Will that change? So look, inflation, the last part we have is 8.5%. If you look at some of the details, it suggests it's going to moderate. You know, we know year over year base effects are going to get easier. We can look at gas prices. They're lower in April than they were in March. That's going to be ultimately disinflationary. But we can't have high conviction on exactly where it's going to trend. So if you're the Fed, you still have this inflation problem. You still have to be aggressive. So 50 basis points in early May still looks you know, likely. Another 50 basis points in June is probable. I think 25 basis points thereafter for at least a couple of meetings. That gets us into the fourth quarter where, the, where we're at a Fed funds rate of around 2%. So I think that is pretty much, barring some sort of shock, kind of almost set in stone. I think what happens next year is the more interesting question because the Fed is talking about three or four more hikes next year. That's what the market's pricing. Mm -hmm. But I think if inflation is down to like 4% and it's trending lower, I think the Fed can sort of take its foot off the brake a little bit and say like, all right, let's see how things are trending. If it's falling, we think it's going to continue to fall. Let's not go too far and risk actually now slowing growth, causing a recession, causing unemployment to rise. Right. So that's a little bit of a fallback then for Jay Powell and the Fed. It's just to hold steady if need be exactly. next year. Great. Yeah. Really quickly, anything else investors should be tracking? I know there's still concern about volatility in the equity markets. I know we're just starting earnings season. So S&P 500 companies will be reporting over the next few weeks. It'll be a really good gauge to see what guidance looks like, especially from the airlines and those travel kind of companies. But anything that we should be looking at? So I think earnings are probably better than people feared uh, for the Q1. I think the focus really much is on the guidance going forward. And that, again, maybe a little bit better than expected. 
We've talked a lot about the U.S. Mm -hmm. There's still obviously the war in Ukraine, the implications there for the European economy, for commodity prices to go up. And shutdowns in China. Shutdowns in China. Uh, you know, that could affect supply chains. So definitely external shocks on top of the Fed raising rates and cooling things here. The final thing I'd just say from the market's perspective, and this ties into the Fed, there is some chatter by some people, including a former Fed official, that ultimately the Fed will have to bring down stock prices to kind of bring down financial conditions and slow growth if they want to cool inflation. So the Fed will never say they're star targeting sort of like the, the equity markets, but I feel like if that's the only way to slow the economy, that does create some downside risk, which means the stock market, instead of being an indicator of where are we going to be six months from now, sort of reflecting external factors, it's almost like you're targeting that to cool so that six months later, the economy actually is slowing. So I think that's a bit of a risk that does the Fed feel like it actually has to alter or sort of negatively impact financial conditions in order to slow growth. I think right now they don't have to do anything that could be a factor later on this year. Yeah, Jason, thank you very much. Always a, a really interesting conversation when we look at all that's going on. And with the uncertainty out there, this is really helpful. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Great. And for more information and access to UBS content, particularly from our chief investment office, visit our website at UBS.com forward slash views. And make sure to follow us on social media. We're on all the platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Plus, all of our UBS trending episodes are available on demand on our website and on the UBS YouTube channel. And as always, if you do have any questions about your own portfolio, make sure to speak with a financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. Have a great day, everybody. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We will see you soon.